Um, thanks very much for giving us this forum to share our work. This is a project on uh, models and methods for evaluating accessibility. Um, and this is part of a larger constellation of problems on resource allocation or site selection, or I think here at Cardo, it's territory management. Um, and depending on the context of this problem, there are different right, constraints and goals that we have. Right? So if you're choosing the next site for a store, the next franchise, you want to maximize market share or profit, it's fine if you have heavy demand at one location, there's a long line uh, right at the lunch hour. You don't care so much about missed locations. If you're thinking about where to put the next firehouse, you care a lot about having uh, the response time as low as possible and you have to cover everything. Um, and typically you're going to oversupply this resource, right? Usually the fire trucks are sitting, imp uh, sitting idle because they can't get called out twice. But exact times are super, super important. We're going to be thinking about provisioning public resources. And here again, there's uh, a fork that you can take. A park uh, can be busy, but it's not going to get used up. You can think of it as a sort of inexhaustible resource. Um, and we'll be thinking about doctors, which whose time is usually pretty well spent. So that's a saturated public resource. All of these problems and others depend on accurate and large origin destination time matrices on different networks, be they by foot or pub car, or public transportation, shipping, so forth. And being able to calculate these matrices at large scale has obvious applications for other things. The last talk talked about delivery and so forth. And so what we want to talk about in this talk is uh, a new strategy or reviving an old strategy for modeling resource allocation and uh, new methods for calculating these matrices at large scale. We're doing this in the context of potential spatial accessibility of healthcare in the United States, potential, that is to say, the boundaries to access that are perceived, not after people have paid some high cost to get there, spatial accessibility as opposed to other socioeconomic barriers to access. It's healthcare in America, but the techniques that we're thinking about apply just as well to other saturated public resources. So we started with this just basic fact that a lot of you may be familiar with, that there's a shortage of physicians in rural America. There's about a third fewer physicians per capita. And so the natural follow-up to this is where the shortage is and who are the people who are providing care for the underserved populations. And so the simple thing to do is to just take the ratio, the patients per physician, and that tells you the caseload for all of the physicians. And if you've thought about accessibility before, you know that this is sort of too naive an approach. You can see that in Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma, where there are counties that have very high number of patients per capita versus next to counties that have very low levels of patients per capita. And presumably, people are going to cross those boundaries. Um, the boundaries are permeable, so that simple ratio, the PPR, um, is a little too naive in this case. Nevertheless, it's used by the US government in designating medically underserved areas. You can improve it a little bit by coming up with regions that better encapsulate uh, primary care service, which is what Dartmouth does for primary care service areas. Uh, but one of the standard you know, approaches to dealing with this is to use floating catchment areas where you move all of the boundaries away from the subject. So the subject can't escape their own catchment. Now you have a PPR in that boundary. But the problem is that there may be you know, different demands on those resources. You've expanded the catchment away from a single subject, but people on the edge of that boundary can still enter or exit. And so the current state of the art for the last sort of 15 years has been this two-stage floating catchment where we first think about the demand on individual uh, providers. So this doctor is available to 4,400 patients. Each one gets a fraction of the time. And then uh, you consider a patient they get a fraction of three other doctors who have different numbers of patients to care for. And you end up with not four over 4,400, but one over uh, 880, so a little bit better. And there's some questions that go along with this. How do you think about distance? Um, and sorry, you can do this across all space. It would look like this. How do you calculate distance? Uh, currently, right, everyone uses a network distance of some kind. You can think about what range or distance de dependence is appropriate for this problem. And that's a question that will continue to haunt us a little bit through this talk. Um, but this, is, this has become the state of the art. The Luo and uh, Wang paper was, has been cited like 700 times since it started. And it's been 
um, enhance and modify in a number of ways. So to put in a distance dependence within the floating catchments um, to allow patients to have preferences for closer locations and so forth. But there are a lot of things that the floating catchment areas don't do. There's uh, no response to busy locations or congested locations. When I first came to Chicago, I didn't see the doctor for a year and a half because I just couldn't get an appointment. So that's a real thing. Um, the demand is based at fixed origins, whereas in our daily lives, we know that you, know, you go to work and home and it can be convenient to go to the doctor near your work location as well. Um, often the floating catchment areas have sharp cutoffs at the catchment edges. Usually there's just a single travel mode that you can do better. And this is usually done at the scale of maybe a dozen counties or a couple of states. And so we want to do better on all of these counts. We want to develop methods uh, for having a much larger origin destination matrix in terms of the scope, uh, granularity, and number of modes. And we want a model that allows us to incorporate those modes, allows us to incorporate home and uh, work locations, and includes competition between the destinations. And so the basic intuition of our model is this. If you're choosing which doctor to go to and you're the green patient, I would go to the one on the right uh, because he has fewer patients currently. And if the doctor is a little bit further away, I might still go there. If the doctor is yet further away, I might still go to them. And the fact that I'm willing to do this right, relieves the demand at my home location uh, because I'm not going to that doctor anymore. But if this doctor is far enough away, I'm going to give up and go home. And so we encapsulate this in an agent-based uh, simulation uh, where the agents are selecting the location that minimizes the cost of care. We consider all locations within 100 kilometers of them, and we shift the demand to the cheapest one. The cost we're calculating as the sum of two parts, a congestion cost and a travel cost. The congestion cost is just the demand over the supply normalized by the national rate of physicians per capita. And the travel cost is that travel time that I mentioned already. So this is the home or the work origin going to the physician's office. It can be on a road or a transportation network. Ultimately, we're gonna be doing 130 million origin destination pairs. This is per hour inputs, but this is relevant to any floating catchment or any other accessibility or any of the other problems that I've already talked about. So that, that time cost is normalized by some parameter tau, which is converted into a cost. You can see in this that for a minimization, the rho and tau could be scaled together without affecting the minimization if you scale them up or down. So we take the liberty of fixing rho, and then tau is a free parameter in this fit. And so you should worry if it matters what level of, you know, what value of tau we use. So is there data on this? Well, we know that people want to use a doctor within half an hour or an hour of them, depending on their virality. But that's a different statement from saying that's how they value the trade-off between their commute and the congestion at the point of care. And so what we are going to do is we're going to show you that at least for identifying the places that have shortages, the choice of the value of tau value, uh, matters relatively little for, for identifying those areas. So once we have this objective function defined, we're going to cyclically iterate over the patient locations. The location really becomes our agent in this model. And we're going to allocate demand from the cheapest used resource, to, or the most expensive used resource to the cheapest available one over and over again. And so this is just a greedy optimization. And the algorithm converges when there is no cheaper uh, option available. In other words, there's a single cost per location. The advantages with respect to the FCAs are that it incorporates feedback between agents. It's extensible to multiple origins and travel modes. And certain agents uh, can choose, right? They can choose both origin and destination locations. Um, the costs are separable between the congestion costs and just the uh, travel time that it takes to get there. In rural areas, there's a high travel cost and we wanna see if it's also congestion. And this isn't really a point of the model itself, but rather of its implementation, that it's done efficiently enough 
that we can do uh, travel time matrices for the entire US at track level and do this quickly on, on a laptop with an amenities. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it to Dan for talking about some of the data inputs. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, so Jamie talked about the model. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the methods. Um, basically, any sort of access model is likely gonna require large OD matrices. In our case, we wanted to do it for the entire country. And after this, we'll show you some results, show you what that looks like. Um, but essentially, oh, got it, never mind. Essentially, we have to calculate a couple of things, right? We have to calculate the congestion cost, which is just demand and supply, ACS data, and primary care service area data, and OD matrices, and some other stuff. Um, and these OD matrices are the real challenge here. To do this at the national scale uh, requires some, some kind of new infrastructure, or rather cheaper infrastructure than what then currently exists. And so we had to essentially make our own pipeline. And so we did that using Docker, S3, AWS, um, and we made our pipeline. And essentially, it will ingest OpenStreetMap data, ACS data, um, GTFS data, run calculations on the cloud via these Docker containers, and output OD matrices. Um, and the nice part about this is that one county is one unit of work. So you can basically take one county, submit one job, for every single county in the United States and generate a national OD matrix in under two hours. So how do, what does that look like? Uh, so starting with ACS data, it's pretty simple. We just get the block weighted census tract centroids. And in our case, we're just gonna use tract centroids for the whole country. Um, those are considered the origins and destinations in our model. And we chose those because they have measures of demand and supply. Uh, in our case, demand is just the population of the tract, and the supply is just the number of providers. You could get more granular here. You could go down to the block level or even the parcel level if you had the right data. In our case, we don't. We don't have a measure of doctors at the block or tract or, or parcel level. So we're using tracts. Um, so starting with those centroids, uh, we take a county, in our case, our home county, Cook County, and we draw a 100 kilometer buffer around that county. We then get all of the tracks that are within that buffer, get all of the centroids for all of those tracks, and then we route basically from every county or every track that is in the gray area to every track that is in the gray area and the blue area. So the gray area is origins, and the destinations are everywhere in the gray area and the blue area. And we do this to avoid the overlapping problem. We can use counties as units of work um, without having weird edge effects, and we can get a full coverage major, matrix for the entire US. So we take those matrices, and for the actual routing, we just clip the OSM network with the same buffer. And then we snap the origins and destinations to that street network. And then we route between them. And so we have something that looks like this, basically for every single tract in the country. As Jamie said, it's about 130 million OD pairs. And what does this look like? This is Chicago. And in practice, you know, in real time, it would look something like that. Starting from some destination or origin in the loop, you're routing to all of the census tracts in the city for 100 kilometers. Uh, and we do this, as I said, for every tract in the country. And we also do some other stuff. We separate urban and rural driving times. Obviously, people in rural areas drive way, way faster. People in New York seem to drive very slow. Um, and basically, the result is one giant C CSV. It's just a, a huge uh, OD matrix. And at some point, we will make that freely available to download. Um, so this is the OD matrix starting in Hyde Park, which is where the university is. This is for driving. And we do the same thing, essentially that same process, using a different container for transit. So we use OpenTrip Planner to do our transit routing. 
And we get very similar OD matrices just with different times. Uh, and we also have, no, that's not gonna work. I'll do it later. Um, and so we can only do this really where, where there are GTFS feeds available um, and where there's you know, actual public transit infrastructure, which is about 20 cities in the US. So what are the benefits here? Well, one county, as I said, is one unit of work, uh, which is great because you get an OD matrix as your output, um, but it also means that you can distribute the computation, computation for this national matrix. If you have four counties or a thousand, right, you can just spin up more containers, run each one, and get an output for all of them. And the result is one big OD matrix. As I said, this takes the computation time down a lot from, you know, if you were doing it in sequence uh, from weeks or, or days down to about two hours. And it also really, really lowers the cost. Um, it's totally free. All the, so all the stuff we use here is totally open source. Um, don't have to use network analysts, right? Uh, it's computationally really, really cheap. So we run all of this on AWS. It's about $20 to run the entire country at the track level. It's scalable. So as I said before, you could use this for blocks or even parcels. It would take longer, um, but it's totally doable. And in fact, you can chop up different counties into multiple jobs to run blocks and it works just fine. And it's really expandable. Uh, you can easily incorporate new modes of travel, right? You could do OTP for walking or something like that and just have a separate container. Um, and essentially what you end up with is this giant OD matrix that is an input for our results, which I will let Jamie share. Thanks, Dan. So with all of this in hand, this is what the uh, access cost for the country look like. This is the fractional deviation from the national mean. So the national mean is zero here in areas with high costs or poor accessibility are red and low costs are blue. And what you see already is that there is huge heterogeneity in rural areas, right? New Hampshire and Vermont are fine. Montana is worse off, but given how low the population density is, they're doing really well. Utah and, and Southern Texas are a little worse off. This is using a tau value of 60 minutes. So six minute uh, value or travel time is equivalent of 10% of the congestion. And so if you run through tau, um, obviously people are willing to travel further, they're less willing to accept congestion, and so everything is going to converge towards the national mean. But what you'll see is that things have gone from red to pink, things aren't really crossing. And so another way of visualizing this is to watch um, for different measures of virality from rural to central metro. On the right hand, on the uh, left hand side, you'll see uh, the relative uh, cost converging towards the national mean as we run through tau, but the ordering remains consistent. If you normalize that distribution before doing that, you get the plot on the right hand side and there's less movement in that space. And so the areas that we identify as having uh, low access pretty much remain consistent, uh, independent of the choice of tau. Another way of thinking about that is the Spearman's rank. Um, we're using a value of tau equals 60. For anything from tau of 10 minutes to three hours, you have a 90% Spearman's rank correlation. So that gives you a sense that in terms of identifying places with low access, it doesn't matter too, too much. I wanna talk about two specific applications of the model. One is home and work origins. And this is something that hasn't been done or hasn't been possible for uh, FCA methods. And so what we do is we establish tunnels between the home origin and work and the work uh, location. And if the work is cheaper, then people will switch their demand to the work location and it'll get managed there. Uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to use the well-known wormhole between Northwestern, uh, where uh, Evanston, where Northwestern is, and Marshall, Illinois, on the Indiana line. And as I turn on this tunnel, you can see that the value down in Marshall uh, corresponds to the value, the cost in Evanston. Um, but more than that, the value, the costs around Marshall also drop because you're removing demand effectively from that location. 
we can use real data for the commuting flows. This is the loads data for work to uh, home to work location. And the difference here is more subtle. So this is with just nominal 60 minutes. This is with commuting flows. And basically what it's doing is giving everyone a free ticket to work where they can then start over again. So it's going to reduce the, the extremes of this distribution. If we're thinking about cities, we can think about multiple travel modes. And so we use the ACS to assign populations to those with, uh, with or without a car. And those without a car are forced to use the more expensive public transportation network. Since, so that's what you see on the left-hand side, basically transit costs are higher than driving costs. We apply that to the track level by the populations that have a car. You see basically in Chicago, the, the west side and the south side, i.e. poorer populations, have higher costs. So with just driving matrices, you're going to be underestimating costs on the poorest populations. But those differences are generally less than 10%, which is to say small with respect to the differences between urban and rural areas. So I'm coming to the end of time. The question is, who is facing the rural shortage? By constructing this detailed measure, um, we can unwind the human, the patient commuting flows, and then also the physician commuting flows. And what we find is that it's the education levels of the patient population that seem to be driving the shortages. It's not so much population density as population education that people, the doctors seem to be choosing. So the takeaways um, for us are that it's easy or relatively straightforward to enhance the scale, granularity, and number of modes for origin destination matrices using distributed methods. The methods are open, they're somewhat technically demanding, uh, but the data is free for others to use. Dan already showed you the site and we'll make the matrices available in bulk uh, soon. We were trying to integrate this into national systems as well. We want to um, suggest that a rational agent model provides an intuitive and extensible and computationally efficient framework for addressing many of the issues with FCA access measures, and we can apply that to understanding where the shortages of care really are in, in the US. All of this code is available, the model itself and the Docker containers for doing this, um, and you can check out the travel matrix itself. That's all. Thanks.